Hello and welcome to the Angus Report, a news program that's geared specifically toward cattle producers. I'm Bob Cervera. And I'm Paige Wallace. From American Angus Association headquarters in St. Joseph, Missouri, we bring you the week's top headlines, including a look at some of the changes in store for the 2012 Farm Bill. With corn prices on the rise, we'll hear how farmers and ranchers can use byproducts from the milling and ethanol industries as economical feed options. We'll learn how export markets continue to play an important role in Angus beef demand. And two cattle producers offer tips for transitioning the farm to the next generation. This is the Angus Report. Our top story for the week. Congressional leaders have begun preliminary work on the 2012 Farm Bill, and the House Ag Committee is expected to make recommendations to a Congressional Super Committee by mid-October. Policymakers have already promised drastic changes in farm subsidies and program funding. Now, commodity, crop insurance, and conservation funding fall under scrutiny. Because of some budget constraints, it's going to be different this time than it has been in the past. The chairman of both the House and the Senate Ag Committees have basically said, give us a total number, a budget that we can work with for the Farm Bill, and then let the committee decide how to spend that money. The other things to, to watch for uh, is, is that there, the Farm Bill becomes kind of a place of convergence for a lot of social forces, not all of which are very friendly to animal agriculture. This industry, the beef industry, is going to have to be really, really careful as we move through the drafting of the 2012 Farm Bill. A series of automatic cuts to the 2012 Farm Bill could happen as early as January if a 12-member special committee charged with trimming farm spending can't agree on a proposal. Export markets continue to play an important role in U.S. beef sales. As Certified Angus Beef's Jeff Bednar explains, a growing middle class worldwide is driving demand for quality beef. Well, ex exports are flying high right now. We've got some real advantages from a currency standpoint where we have a real advantage over some of our competing uh, other export countries. Well, our, our best year from an international standpoint for the brand was 2003, where we sold approximately 90 million pounds to our international countries outside of the United States. And that dropped to roughly 33 million pounds in a short two years after BSC. And we recovered this year to where we're, we will most likely set a record for the most sales from an international standpoint that we've ever sold for the brand. Bednard says expanding international sales accounts for approximately 11% of all certified Angus beef sales. When it comes to transitioning the farm to the next generation, communication is key, but it's not an easy process. Effective estate planning takes patience, common goals, and the ability to plan long term. The first step that they have to do, and it's the one that is excruciating to most, is they have to come up with the hard answers to what do they want the operation to do in the future. What are the goals? Where do they want it to go? Do they want it to stay within the family? Do they want to provide income out of it for their retirement? Do they want to get out of the operation entirely? And those are the real hard questions that too often they take those questions to a lawyer or a financial advisor to try to get answers to and they absolutely can't answer them. It has to come from the family. What do we want to do with this entity we call a farm and how we want it to look 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years from now. Come into it with pure, purely defined goals that you can provide for your family and make a living for your family and progress the farm for the next generation. Increasing corn prices have more cattlemen looking to alternative feed solutions, but there's much to consider from nutritional value and rations to shipping costs. The ethanol industry and the distiller's grains produced from that has had more impact on the cattle feeding industry than, than anything else during my career here at the University of Nebraska. And I would say that, that uh, right now, uh, probably 75, maybe even to $100 per head more profit for a cattle feeder if they're using wet distiller's grains, and they're reasonably close to an ethanol plant, compared to feeding an all-corn diet. The, the level of distiller's grains that we use in the finishing diet uh, 
certainly can vary. And as we've done analysis on that, it looks to us that in the range of 35 to 40 percent of the diet, dry matter is about the optimal level. So to get that 75 to to $100 savings, one needs to be in this level of feeding of wet distiller's grains. The distiller's grains at that level has about 135% the feeding value of what the corn is that's replacing. Because the wet distiller's grains is 65% uh, water, that means that this diet now is going to be probably a 40 uh, plus percent water. So that's critically important that producers are able to handle the moisture contents in pricing and in diet formulation. The University of Nebraska also offers an online manual that describes additional recommendations for feeding corn byproducts. And when the Angus Report continues, a look at how genetics plays a role in marbling and what cattlemen get paid. Plus, understanding growth traits and how to use birth, weaning, and yearling weight EPDs in herd selection.